Good afternoon, everyone. And so what I'm going to talk, talk about today is the two-photon lithography process. So before we start, I want to see a show of hands on how many of you have actually used or are aware of this. OK, so some of you are aware of this technology. So what I'm going to talk about today is two keywords. One is rapid, and the other is versatile. These two keywords are not generally used with two-photon lithography. So two-photon lithography is a nanoscale additive manufacturing technique. It's usually very, very slow and limited to a small set of materials. And what I'm going to talk about is how, how did we actually expand the material set in the second part of the talk. And the first part, I'm going to go through how did we actually scale up this process, so increase the speed by about a 1,000 times. Before we even go to that, why, why do we care about nanoscalarity manufacturing? So these are some images of structures printed using the two photon lithography process. Images on your left, these are structures where the fine nanoscale feature makes a difference in the function. So the image on the top, that's an image of a architecture and material where the density of the material changes by a factor of seven within about 100 micron thickness. And these kind of materials are very useful in controlling the pressure waves as you're compressing a material to very high pressures that inside, uh, inside that of planets. So these are very useful for studying nuclear fusion reactions. And the second material, this material out here, this is an architecture material where because the features are so small, the flaws are smaller, and the strength of this material is fairly high, and it approaches the theoretical limit of the material. But at the same time, because these features are so small and most of the material is just air, the weight of the material is very low. So we get a very strong material at a, at a very small amount of mass for the material. The other two images, images on your right, these are, these are structures where the function, functional parts are on a few micron length scale. So you need two photon lithography or something with a fine nanoscale resolution to make sure that the surfaces are smooth because these are either manipulating light where the surface roughness matters or these are going inside human body where the surface roughness is very important. So even though the features are on the micron, single micron to 10 micron size, you want additive manufacturing on a lens scale less than a micron. Now, the process, two photon lithography, some of you have uh, used this or are familiar with this. The process itself is fairly straightforward. So what this process is, you take a beam of light, laser light, focus it into a very small spot, and then move this laser spot in 3D space within a photopolymer material. So this photopolymer material, when light hits this material and the intensity is high enough, that material is going to get converted from a liquid to a solid state, okay? And there are chemical reactions. We'll go into the details later on, but the general idea is wherever you hit, wherever the focus of the light hits the material, that gets converted into a solid. Now, what is very, very different about this process versus other light-based IoT manufacturing techniques is the sub-diffraction feature size. So what that means is if you take a light spot, which is, say, a micron wide, your printed structure can be smaller than that light spot. So that is what we mean by sub-diffraction. And we'll look into the details of how do we actually get that, but the general idea is if you take a laser beam and if you can move it around in space, under the right conditions, you can then make these 3D structures by stacking up these individual spots. So these spots are voxels or volumetric pixels. And these are some interesting structures, the GT logo. This is something we printed here using uh, Georgia Tech's nanoscribe system. The other two images are from Lawrence Livermore showing the resolution, less than 150 nanometers. And you can actually print millimeter scale structures with this resolution. Now the problem with this process has been is it's very, very slow. And if you look at the commercial capability for two for down lithography compared with other manufacturing, IoT manufacturing techniques, there's a trade-off. That trade-off is between resolution and the rate of printing. And the rate of printing of uh, two for down lithography, the commercial system, is at least 1,000 times to 10,000 times lower. And there is this uncertainty you know, about a factor of 10, depending on how much of the material are you printing the structure, how much of it is porous. But it's 1,000 to 10,000 times slower. 
but what you get is very small features. And if I'm looking at this trade-off, why do I care about this? Why not just try to push this projection microstereolithography as far out in a resolution as I can? The reason is there's a fundamental limit based on light, diffraction of light. Okay, you cannot reduce single photon absorption, traditional light absorption, to very, very small spots below the size of the light spot. Okay, so that means that this direction, improving the resolution, is not, not physically a good idea. You'll hit a limit. So what we did is let's improve the rate of this process. Sorry, rate of the two photon lithography process in sort of trying to reduce the resolution of traditional additive manufacturing techniques. So what we have done in the past is that red uh, mark there is about a thousand times faster than uh, commercial systems. We are still working on improving it further. And what I'm going to discuss today are some of the issues of how did we get there, what are open questions uh, still left in this. And if, if I'm broadly looking at other metrics that I care about, not just the speed, there is also this metric of process knowledge and the material space that we can work in in this process. And right now, all of these are really areas where not a lot of work has been done for scalable parts. And I will, I will go into details of what I mean by this within the context of scalability. Okay? So what we did very quickly, the results of the throughput, so in the throughput aspect, if you look at different um, implementations of two photon lithography, S and P here are serial. So you take a point and move it in space, that's serial. P are parallel, where you try to do multiple points simultaneously. So in the past, there used to be a trade-off not just between two photon lithography and other additive manufacturing techniques, but also in implementations of two photon lithography. And this trade-off was resolution versus rate. A lot of people tried making it parallel, but they failed in getting very fine features in the third dimension. Okay, so we broke this trade-off where we printed very, very thin features at the same time printing about a thousand times finer. Before we go into that, I want to spend a little bit of time into the background of two photon lithography as to how do we get these very small features, but still with light, and how can we actually get parallelization if we understand that aspect? So what is key to making two photon lithography work is two photon absorption, okay? So if you take traditional materials, so material on your left, traditional materials will absorb light in a single photon absorption mode. So what that means is for each uh, jump of a molecule from a lower state to a higher excited state, if you take one, absorb one photon at a time. And if you have the right photon, which means photon of the right energy to make that jump, that material will absorb light, and that energy can be used for reactions downstream. Now in two photon absorption, what happens, let's say a material wants to jump from a lower state to a higher state, but doesn't have the right illumination, so you don't have the right photons. It could take two photons of half the energy to make that jump. Now, if it does that, it needs both of these two photons to arrive simultaneously or near simultaneously. That happens, then instead of a single photon, you can absorb two photons of half energy, make that jump, and then use that energy downstream to do the chemical reactions. So if you're looking at just absorption, these two look very different from a single photon versus two photon perspective. In a single photon absorption, most of the light is absorbed where light hits the material first, okay? But the, the focus is downstream, so the focus is right here, but most of the absorption happens at the top. Whereas in two photon absorption, most of the absorption happens here at the focus of the light spot where the intensity is high enough because the dosage or the absorption depends on the square of intensity and the intensity is high only there. Now mathematically, if you look at the scaling of absorption, what's going on is two photon absorption is proportional to I square, so it's a nonlinear process, intensity square, and second, it's a very, very weak process. So if we take materials, regular materials, and hit it with light, light from, say, this projector, we don't expect materials to start absorbing in the two photon mode. 
what you need is very high intensity on the order of terawatts per centimeter square. So if, if we compare that to sunlight on, on Earth's surface, that's about a trillion times higher intensity, okay? And we can get these intensities with femtosecond light, pulse light. And you focus that pulse light into a very small spot, you can achieve these very high intensities. So that is the reason we need to select the right light source. If we take the materials that cure under light, combine the two, then we have the right conditions for two photon lithography. Wherein, what you would see is that the dosage would be restricted to a small spot within the light spot. Okay? So now that red region is where two up to that red curve from the center up to this point is the region where light has been absorbed in the two photon mode. So that is smaller than this blue curve, which is actually the light spot, the intensity of light distribution. And this tells you that, okay, so with this kind of technique, I can then confine my printing to a small spot smaller than the light spot itself. Okay, so if we have this from a physics perspective, if you get this right, then from a, uh, from a perspective of 3D printing, what you can now do is take this light spot, scan it in space, 3D space within a polymer, and then stack up these individual spots one over the other to make a 3D structure. So the differences are you can do this within the polymer itself at any depth. You're not limited to the, just the top. And these small spots are smaller than the light spot. Okay, so these are the consequences of two photon absorption. From a manufacturing perspective, if you want to make a 3D part, the process flow would be, I would start with the digital information. Okay, digital information of the part that I want to create. So this is some kind of STL file that represents the part that you want to print. Convert that into a series of tool paths, physical uh, spots that you want to move the light spot to. Okay? Some of these are shown from the proprietary software for Nanoscribe and how you would do that using some of the software that Nanoscribe has. So once you convert into tool paths, you would go into the actual system and move the light spot around to print the 3D part develop that, what development means is you would, you would dissolve the sections of the resist, the material in which you're printing, the, the parts which were, the sections that were not exposed to light, you could dissolve this out in a solvent. So you're left with a 3D solid structure, and then you can look under different tools to verify the, the shape, size, and also the material properties. Okay, so this is a fairly quick overview of two photon lithography. From the perspective of uh, understanding the basic physics of why we get small features, and if you are able to get the right conditions, how do you make a 3D structure? The next aspect is if we compare against what the rest of the world typically does with what we have done in terms of increasing the throughput. So the rest of the world does this serial uh, two for down lithography, where you take this part and move it in space. So it's moving fairly slowly to create this 3D structure. When I say fairly slowly, let me hold this here. Fairly slowly is for printing about a millimeter cube, it would take anywhere from 10 hours to 100 hours, depending on the porosity of the part. So it's fairly slow because you're printing millimeter scale structures with nanoscale 100 nanometer features. Now in our case, what we did is we said, Let's scale this process by processing more than a single point. So process a million points at once, okay? So what we are doing is instead of focusing a single point, we are focusing million points simultaneously where we can individually switch on and off each of these points and then focus this within any depth that we want within the photoresist. If we can achieve these two things, then we can do this 3D printing in a stack Layer, layer by layer process where you project individual uh, pixels of planes of pixels on each plane where that plane is arbitrarily patterned and then stack it up, stack up different planes to make the 3D structure. So this is very, very similar to projection stereolithography in implementation. You would project a plane, stack it up and create a 3D structure. What is different here with respect to stereolithography 
is the resolution of the part or resolution of printing. So on the uh, on your left, these are images. This image is uh, from literature, previous um, attempts at creating these projection type two for down lithography implementation. So yeah. Are you able to hear me now? Okay, thanks. Okay, so the images on the image on the left, that's a projection, single projection made in a photoresist, and that projection, once you look at the part, you would see that it's polymerizing everything along the depth of the photoresist. So it's not a good way of doing 3D printing. What we are getting is an extruded 2D part, which is extruded in the depth direction. What we really want is printing, when you project that plane, we don't print anything above and below that plane. So that is depth resolvability. And we were able to get that. I'll show you in a minute how we got there. But if you can get this depth resolvability, now you can print this about a micron thick layer and then keep stacking up individual layers to create your 3D structure. Okay. So some of the structures that we created were these individual nanowires, which are stretched across structures, which, are, which were themselves printed using this process. These are some of the thinnest nanowires. And when I say the thinnest, it's not just in plane, it's also the depth direction, which has been a challenging dimension to control. The other structures, some of those micropillar forests, they were printed in less than about two hours, when it usually takes about three days to print using the serial technique. So really fast and being able to print arbitrary patterns. And then we printed this uh, impossible bridge, which is a very long 90 degree overhang bridge with submicron features and printed on a length scale of about a millimeter. So again, these are very, very challenging to print using any other technique. Some other process, sorry, some other structures that we printed so this shows the ability to do not just a grid-like structure, but also project arbitrary curved structures. So this structure, again, is printed using a pixelated image. I'll show you in a minute what, how we implemented this. But the idea is all of this was printed in less than 10 milliseconds. So you projected a single image, had all of these patterns, and then if you want, you can stack it up in the third direction. We can also stitch these individual projections together and make millimeter scale structures, the structure on the top that took about eight minutes to print, usually takes about a day to print, about, several, about 10 hours to a day to print depending on porosity. So how did we actually achieve this parallelization? So we achieved this parallelization by projecting an image onto the photopolymer. I'm going to skip some of the details of the optics right now. But the general idea is this is very, very similar to a projection stereolithography. This is a digital mask, which is exactly same as the mask in here in this projector. We took that off and you hit it with light wherever you have your pixels on and off. Corresponding to the on parts, you would see an image along this direction into the photopolymer. The off pixels, you would see no light. So then you can project that digital information into a photopolymer and convert that into a solid part. So these two are the inputs, digital information, which is any bitmap image that you can, that you want. And these two are then stacked up alternately in the third direction to create that 3D structure. Okay, so in terms of understanding what goes on in enabling us to print this uh, a large print with some micron features. So there are three steps to the process. One is when light hits the material, we need light spots that are themselves very small. So how do we focus light spots in the third dimension and in plane to very, very small spots? Second is we need to make sure that the reactions that happen when light hits the material, they don't propagate out very quickly, very far. So we want to confine those chemical reactions. And the third is once the material has converted enough, we want to stop and that tells us what's the size of the structure that we want. So I'm going to very quickly go through all three of these to show you how we actually got this parallelization. So key to making this parallelization work is 
when we project this light into the polymer material, we want to make sure that the light spot is focused in the third dimension. Getting focusing in the 2D plane is pretty straightforward. You make sure that the light focuses into a very small spot. Getting it focused in the third dimension is not straightforward. So what we did is we worked with the time domain of light. So these are femtosecond light pulses. And what we did is we stretched the light pulse as it moves through the optical system and then compress it really up only at the focal plane. Okay, so if I can do this here, which is right out here, away from the focal plane, I stretch the pulse out in time domain, and then I compress it and stretch it again. If I can do that, then the intensity of light changes to a point that the highest intensity is only at the focal plane. Away from the focal plane, the intensity drops, and we can use that to make sure the reactions happen only near the focal plane. Okay, so that's the key to making this work in terms of projecting a large image and also at the same time getting very, very thin light, uh, light, light sheets, which are patterned. In terms of optical modeling, so it's very, very straightforward in terms of how do you set it up. You have two lenses and your projector, the digital mask straight out from this. And a lot of people have, have this question is how do we conceptualize temporal focusing? How do we conceptualize time domain focusing? And one way to understand this is if you think of femtosecond light, femtosecond light always has multiple wavelengths. Okay, it's a laser light, but it still has multiple wavelengths. When that hits a diffraction grating, then it will be split into different wavelengths. Okay, that's exactly what we do at the DMD. A DMD is a periodic structure of mirrors. So when light hits that structure, it splits into the different wavelengths. Now, if I can make sure that these different wavelengths get converged at the focal plane, then the intensity of light at the focal plane would be high, but everywhere else, because the different wavelengths are separated out in space, the energy and the intensity would be low. Okay, so that's the key to making this work. Use this DMD as a diffraction grading. Make sure that all wavelengths get converged only at the focal plane. So we were able to model this and implement this. The key thing I want to highlight here is these colored images that show the intensity of light. In those colored images, so this is the light propagation direction, and I, what I want to highlight is this, that the intensity of light is dropping away from the focal plane. So this is the key to making the projection technique work. Because we can do that, very little or no polymerization will happen in these, kind, these regions which are away from the focus. And we could then project the image, stack up different images, and make a 3D part. So this is my digital information. This is the image on the projector that gets converted into an intensity distribution, which looks very, very similar to the image. And you can then stack up and make your 3D parts. I'll just briefly pause here to see if there are any questions. If you have questions, feel free to stop and ask, or we could again take it at the end. Okay, so that was the first part, which is uh, I project an image on the projector and then get a light intensity distribution, which is very small. And it's, uh, it's small not just in the in-plane direction, but also in the third dimension, the depth direction. The next thing is we actually did the experiments, and what we observed is if you wait long enough, you start getting very, very large features. So any feature be below these lines, these are the only, uh, these are the only features that are sub-diffraction. Everything else is actually bigger than the light spot. And what's going on is we just, we not only need very small light spots, we also want to make sure, or we need to make sure that the reactions don't propagate out so far that you get very large structures. So the next step of the process is really this part, which is often skipped in explaining two-photon lithography and explaining how do you get very small features in two-photon lithography. So in two-photon lithography, most of the absorption is going to happen in the very small region at the focal, in the focal volume. So this is where the absorption happens. 
but the absorption, once the absorption happens, the material is going to start reacting through a chain reaction to form polymers. And that material is going to spread out, or the polymerization front is going to spread out. Because it's a chain reaction, if you don't stop it, it will keep expanding. And without anything to stop, it will actually fill the entire volume of the resist. So what is stopping it from expanding is oxygen diffusing into that spot from the exterior or from the resist itself. And the oxygen is very good at terminating these chain reactions. So I'm skipping a lot of details on the chemistry part, but the, but the implication is, is there's this balance where the chain reaction wants to expand out the size of the part and the oxygen wants to terminate the reaction and confine the reacting part. So the balance of this, these two set of reaction and diffusion will determine how big a part you would get. And we spend a lot of time understanding the dynamics of this in terms of the millisecond time scales it takes for it to grow, the printed voxel, and the length scales on micron and submicron uh, length scales. And what we observed is a lot of the reaction actually happens in the dark, which means you hit it with light, the light only lasts for about 100 femtosecond. So each of these jumps, each of these jumps here is each pulse hitting the material but all of the rest of the time is really the dark zone where there is no light. But the reaction keeps proceeding in the dark. It's a chain reaction, will proceed until all of that, uh, the starting material, I'm broadly saying a starting reacting material without going into details, that is used up. Until that happens, you'll see that reaction. Eventually the size or how much the material is reacting will uh, stabilize. So that tells us, so this kind of analysis tells us what's the feature size going to be after you project and wait for some time. So we did this kind of analysis that was very helpful in actually telling us that what happens if you wait too long, if you increase the power, or you change the size of the feature that you're projecting in the light sheet. And we can predict these widths very well our prediction of heights are not that well, and we are still working on figuring out the details of this process, particularly in terms of calibrating some of the parameters or material properties of the resist. Okay, so up, up to this point, what I have gone through is uh, shown you how to do the projection very quickly. So that scales up because you're going from a point to a large sheet. That helps us scaling up the process by a thousand times. I've also shown you that if, if you want to do that right, we need to make sure that the depth direction is well controlled in the light sheet. And we also make sure that the resist properties that we select are such that it does not propagate too far out of the light, light, light projected region of the light spot. So the next question is, is we saw this question of scalability in terms of the rate, but there is the question of scalability in terms of how many materials can you use. And if you look into the literature, you'll see a, more than a thousand papers over the past 20 years on different materials for two for down lithography. Now, if you look closely, what you would see is a lot of those materials cannot be used to make uh, 3D structures. And I'll go into some of the details of what are really the issues, and even with the large literature set, why, does practical, why is practical printing limited today? So if you want to expand the material palette from what we are doing, let's say, on the system on Nanoscribe here, there are three major approaches that we can take. One is we could change the photoresist itself. So the photoresist may have some functional properties. And when we cure, we get that functional property that we care about. We could change the, or we could post-process the material after printing and convert a material from a polymer into some other class of material. For example, ceramics or metals. And the third approach is we could change the physical process that's happening after light hits the material. For example, instead of polymerization, we could do something else, say a different chemical reaction like reduction, and then get metallic parts instead of polymer parts. So we take the first one, which is chain the photoresist. 
If you want to change the photoresist, we need to know what's in the photoresist. So there are four major components. One is the photoabsorber that converts that light into the reactive species, which is the radicals. And then you have the pre-polymer or the monomer, which actually reacts and creates this polymer chain, the polymer material. The third is an additive, which could be in the form of nanoparticles that you add into the resist that are not necessarily dissolved, they're suspended, but once it's polymerized, you will see those additives in the part, and that will change some property, let's say electrical conductivity. And the fourth part is inhibitor, which is very, very important, which is how do you stop the reaction? Typically, you'll have something that, that fights with the resin to use up the radicals. Okay, so these are the four parts. If you want to change functional properties, we would change the pre-polymer, you would change this, and you would change the additives. Okay, these are the, the two materials you would want to change to print with a different material. So we did this, one of the approach is we said we don't want additives because the issue with additives is it could leach out of the part after printing and development, so properties change over time. So what we said is we're going to change the monomer and we're going to add some molecules, sorry, some atoms onto the backbone of the polymer. So we added these iodine atoms onto the backbone of the polymer itself. So once the polymer reacts to form a cross-link polymer or a long chain, that iodine is in the material and when you look at that material under x-ray, iodine absorbs a lot of x-rays, so that part, printed part, is now radio-opaque, okay? So a lot of people have done this kind of work in which they would change what is attached to the backbone. You could add in silicon, you could add in uh, metal to the backbone of the polymer itself, and then you could get the property that you're looking for after printing. Yes, yeah, so with this kind of approach, we don't see that issue, which is, uh, it's homogeneous on the molecular scale. So each polymer chain will have this uh, ratio, depending on how many molecules react with each other. And so if you look at different spots, you would see, you would not be able to resolve it on the feature level, on the 100 nanometer feature level. So that is why this is a very popular approach for expanding the material set. Now what you would see on this side, I've listed a lot of different things, not just the monomer. So what happens is when we start printing with different photoresists, it's not just a chemistry problem, which is can we create a new material? It's also can we print with this new material? And I want to highlight this issue, which is often ignored, which is you'll see this tall structure here. That tall structure, that's a millimeter tall structure we printed with that new resist. And if you look into the literature, what you will see, most of the new resists that are, that are published in papers, they're limited to about 10 or 10 to 50 micron heights, okay? The reason for that is it's a challenging problem to solve for different properties of the photoresist that enable you to print in different modes and at the same time get the functionality that you want. So in this case, what we are looking for is we want to have this photoresist in which we have some function doped in. At the same time, we want to print millimeter scale structures. The issue is, for those who have, are familiar with two photon, you would see this aberration as a major issue in terms of printing large structures. What aberration is, is if you try tightly focus this light spot into, into a photoresist, if the refractive index of the material is not matched to the medium of the lens, to the medium that the lens was designed for, you would see these beams focusing at different planes from the focal plane. So you'd get a very large light spot instead of getting a very tight, small focus spot. So what the literature has done, or what researchers have done in this field, is they have come up with a very clever workaround. What they do, is they say that let's use the immersion medium for most of the light path, and right at the focus, we are going to use the resist. So this is the approach that they use. The resist is only near the focal plane, but most of the light passes through the photo, sorry, the immersion medium, which has the right index. 
Now what that means is I can now print with a lot of materials, but on, I can only print up to this height, and once I hit that height, then I cannot go any further in terms of the height of the part. Okay, so that limits the height of the structures that we want. And Nanoscribe has come up with some resists that are index matched in which you do the inverse or the upside down printing where now the entire light, light path is within the resist which has an index, refractive index matched to the immersion medium. So now the height is not limited. You can keep building as tall as you want. There are no issues with aberration. But getting this index matching is not straightforward. So this used to be a dark art. A lot of groups would publish, but then not tell you how to get there. So we did this experiment, I think, over two years. What we figured is it's pretty straightforward. You take the photoresist that you, uh, you have a target photoresist with the function that you want. You mix it with some other photoresist that has a higher index or lower index than the target value. So if you mix and match two photoresists that have lower and higher, you'd get the index that you're looking for. So if this is what you want, mix and match something below and above that. So once we did that, now we solved the index matching issue. We have functions. We can now go and expand the material palette by not only having new functions, but also be able to print millimeter scale structures. So we did that for the radio opaque material. We also did it for printing of ceramics, which is the next technique. You add some functionality into the photoresist, and then you post-process it in a way that you remove some sections of the printed, uh, some components of the printed material. So in here, we used a material which has silicon in the backbone, and then pyrolyze this, so remove out by heat some of the carbon, oxygen, and all of the hydrogen, and we are left, left with a ceramic silicon oxycarbide. Uh, others have tried this out with different combinations of resists. So they have also had nitrogen. So you can get a large set of ceramics by printing these polymers and then converting them into ceramics by pyrolyzing them. Okay. So what is key in here is it's not just converting this chemical composition, but it's also holding the geometry while this conversion happens. So that is something that makes us, or that enables us to actually print these ceramic structures additively, where you would see a linear shrinkage when some material is lost, but the relative shapes would still be the same. So you can still make these complex 3D structures in ceramics by printing something which is larger and with something which has a polymer reactive components, so it polymerizes. The third approach is, so I can change the photoresist, I can post-process, but I could also change the chemical reactions that are happening under the influence of light. And one example is this photoreduction, which is instead of having these uh, chemicals react to create long polymer chains, I start with the salt of a metal, and when light hits that material, that salt is reduced into a metallic particle, nanoparticle. So this is very commonly done for mirror making with silver. And if we can replicate that using the light, light projection of this technique, we can then have a high speed uh, projection of metallic nanoparticles and stack up. So, so far what we have shown is we can do this using the serial technique at a high speed by moving the spot in space. You can move it in 3D space, which is these silver particles, nanoparticles printed on top of existing structures to make these 3D uh, metallic structures. So up to this point, what I've shown you, sorry, let me just go through this and then we'll switch over. So th these are some examples of structures printed with the metallic structures. So we can print these grid lines these could also be functional structures where that is a diffraction grading showing a diffraction pattern when light goes through it. And the conductivity of these materials is fairly good, about one-fifth that of the bulk silver. So you could then start making 3D structures which are both conductive and maybe even composites with polymers and metallic uh, sections in there. So what I've shown you so far is uh, scaling up in terms of the speed, 
scaling up in terms of the material set. And now very briefly, I want to show you uh, some of the open questions in 2-4 down lithography. And just looking at it from the perspective of uh, generations of growth in this field, what has really happened is, if you look on the process knowledge axis, uh, about 20 years ago, this process was uh, invented where a light spot was moved in space very slowly and a 3D part was buried. Over the next two generations, the speed of that spot has been increased by a thousand times and our work has scaled it up further by a thousand times by paralyzing this process. But simultaneously, we have also lost a lot of process knowledge or really not necessarily lost, but the process knowledge has really expanded to a point where we only know a little bit, a little fraction of it. Because of which, we are not able to do any of this deterministic printing of parts. And for those who have actually printed parts on Nanoscribe, they may know this issue, which is, let's say I want a 3D part that I want to print. What I do is I start with an STL, I would print. So the question is, what parameters do you print with? Which is, if you're doing a serial, what's the speed at which you're going to move, how you're going to discretize or, or break it up into voxels, and what power are you going to use? So these questions have not yet been answered properly in the literature, which means I take some guesses, print the part, compare the print against the STL to see how close am I to that, and keep repeating this loop. And iteratively, if I'm guessing it right, or after a certain number of iterations, I would arrive at a set of conditions that give me the part that I want. So this is very slow, very expensive, and with experience you will see it takes a lot of time to get a particular functional part. What we want to do is convert this into a deterministic process where you know enough about the process that you go in with your STL, you figure out what your input should be, provide that input, and with the first run, you would get parts to specifications. We are nowhere near that, and some of the work we are doing uh, with the NSF Carrier Award project is this, figuring out the process knowledge gaps that tell us how to deterministically print a part based on this STL, so this should be the inputs that you want to give. I'm going to stop here with this comment that the process itself is now scalable both from a materials perspective and also from a throughput perspective, but we don't know enough about the process to a point that we can deterministically make parts. So applying it to real world applications is still challenging due to a large process knowledge gap. And before I stop, I would like to thank some of my collaborators here. So a lot of this work that I showed you was done in collaboration with uh, Hong Kong, Professor Shi Chi, and a lot of that work was done in Lawrence Livermore with uh, Dr. Nguyen and Dr. Oakdale being collaborators there. Thank you. So we have time for questions, um, if anybody has a question, I'll, let's use the mic just so that everybody can hear. Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, just regarding the comparison process, what um, characterization equipment do you recommend for getting the length scales of these structures? I'm sorry, what could you repeat? What characterization equipment do you use to um, okay. look into the actual printed structures, like a scanning electron microscope or TEM? Yes, it depends on what property you're looking for. If you're looking for geometry, then we are look, when typically use scanning electron microscope to look at the external geometry. We have also used X-ray CT computer tomography to look into internal details on the half a micron lens scale. So if you make 10 micron features, do those exist or have they shifted? And if you're looking for other material properties like composition, you would use a different characterization technique, XPS or EPS, to look at what chemicals are left behind after pyrolysis. Uh, AFM, not so much for the 3D, but particularly when you're looking at single voxels to look at the profiles, uh, heights of the voxels themselves. Thank you very much. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, Chris.
Well, a general question. So you have the two light source were, is that true? One light source. How do you manipulate it so you spread it out? How do you create that, uh, that two beam? Yes, so the two beam is, um, I'm searching for the right word. There are a few papers out there that incorrectly say you need two beams for two photon lithography. You can do two photon lithography with a single beam of light. The reason it's called two photon lithography is because within that same beam of light, two photons are simultaneously absorbed. So if I look at the implementation of the system, Nanoscribe, it has a single beam of light that's focused into a light spot and then moved around. We are not moving two beams and intersecting them. Well, for the focus, how do you get the, the focus? You, what method are you using? Yeah, so for focusing, we would use an objective lens. Take a beam, let's say we have a Gaussian beam, focus it or pass it through an objective lens which has a high numerical aperture. Let's say 1.3 or 1.4. So that is going to be then focused into a diffraction limited spot. So that spot is going to be about 800 nanometers wide with numerical aperture 1.4 or so. So that 800 nanometer spot of light is sufficiently small to give me 150 nanometer features. Because only a section of that light spot is where most of the absorption is going to happen. And if I can make sure that I don't let the reactions proceed out too far off that region, I can have light spots, sorry, I can have printed spots that are 150 nanometer. So the key is to make sure you have as small a spot as possible, which is with a high numerical aperture lens, and then with the resist that don't propagate very fast or don't react very fast out. So that's with traditional, with our technique, you also need to make sure it's in the depth direction focused and that's where the time domain comes into play. Okay, thanks for, thank you for a great talk, I appreciate that. Uh, my question is what governs the degree of polymerization? Uh, is it power, exposure time, or um, you know, what is the uh, impact of temperature, if so? And my another question was, is it an acrylic-based polymer you've been using? Or, I mean, you don't need to say if it's proprietary, but then I just was interested to know that. Um, and what impact it'll have on the glass transition temperature of your polymer? Okay, so, yeah, let me answer, let me answer one by one. We've answered some of these in the past. So let's pick what the material is. So the material is acry acrylate-based. So the functional groups are acry acrylates, polyacrylates, so there are more than one functional group on the same molecule. In terms of uh, the degree of conversion, the degree of conversion depends on how many molecules have cross-linked. And how many molecules cross-link will depend on the dosage, which is effectively a function of the intensity of light, and how long have you exposed that to light. So the time ex of exposure, intensity of exposure, in our case, it also depends on how thick each uh, light spot is, which is what, what's really being projected, because it's not just a single spot, an entire image is being projected. So it depends on all these three things. In terms of the reaction, uh, dependence on the rate of reaction depends on temperature. It is temperature dependent, which means that if you heat up this prop or heat up the resist as you're printing, you will see different sizes and different degrees of conversion. Now, during this process, if, if it's held in ambient, the reaction itself in that small region uh, generates enough heat to heat it up by a few degrees Celsius, but not more. So uh, assuming that it's a constant temperature process is a good enough approximation for many of these reactions. Uh, in terms of the glass transition temperature, the more there is cross-linking, trying to figure out, so it shifts the glass transition temperature. The more it's cross-linked, the more, I believe, glassy it becomes. And it's primarily the temperature that you maintain? Primarily the temperature you work on, uh, you know, deals with the glass transition temperature because at glass transition temperature, these polymers start flowing, and so that might 
impact the rigidity of the uh, structures you are creating. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, one thing to keep in mind is this is not a thermal process. So the process itself is uh, curing, which means it starts with the liquid, which has its own uh, glass transition temperature and so on, and it gets converted into this cured epoxy light material, which will have its own glass transition temperature. What we have tried out is if we heat it up, do we see it softening? It does not soften. It will actually start burning. So that is one, suggesting that that glass transition temperature is uh, not such a good metric for this kind of material uh, to understand its flowability properties. Second is we have seen the glass transition temperature, if you can look at just changes in modulus as a metric for glass transition, if you look at that, then we have seen that it depends a lot more on processing conditions, which is power and speed in the serial. And that effectively changes the number of crosslinks, which is really degree of conversion. And what we have seen is if you go very, very fast, you end up getting very viscous-like material relative to if you go very slow and let it crosslink a lot. would impact the post-processing once you print it out. If you want to do further process, then that will impact because if, yeah. the, if it's not rigid, then the, the post-processing might be a challenge. So yes. that's what I was asking. That if you look into certain things so prior yeah. to doing that. Thank yeah. you, sir. So we looked into the mechanical properties, both the viscoelastic and just uh, looking at the uh, non-strain strain rate dependent properties. So these are reasonably rigid with the elastic modulus at about three gigapascal, so very much epoxy-like or uh, thermoset-like. And they will hold their size over time, so they're not creeping so much as opposed to, let's say, if you print it on some of these traditional 3D printers where you use uh, UV light to cure the material. I, I'm I'm going to ask the last question. Um, so uh, obviously the parallel approach is great for speeding up the XY printing. Um, is there any need to increase speed in the Z axis, and how would you go about doing that? So you still have to build up layer yeah. by layer. <laughs> so our work has been replicated very recently. I believe about a month ago that was published. And we had this idea out. We just did not implement it before then. The idea is, so if you stop and move up, then you're waiting a lot of time and not printing. What you could do is you could rapidly move it up and then keep projecting. So that takes a, that increases it by about a factor of up to 75 to 100 times in the Z direction. So I can keep projecting and moving at the same time. So it's a more of a motion stage-based limitation and how do you project and move. So very similar to clip additive manufacturing but with projection of these femtosecond light shields. Okay. All right, let's thanks Professor Saha one more time. Thank you.